welcome back. I say welcome back with a great smile on my face, thinking that you might not be feeling so happy after you've just done that uh, exercise. Um, and it does evoke, um, it can evoke lots of strong feelings. So it might be again um, useful just to make a few notes in the chat box if you feel there's anything you want to share. Mm. Okay. Yeah, thank you, Maxine. The truth that does set us free even when it's uncomfortable. Yeah, yeah. And frustration with short termism. And actually, we need to move um, into an even different, a longer concept of time. Measures of optimism and concern. Thank you. I'm going to share a quote from um, Joanna Macy. Joanna Macy, is, I can see that some of you have, have come across her before, or many of you have, and uh, her latest, I don't know if it's her latest work, but one of her works, I think 2012, was Active Hope. She co-wrote with um, a guy called Chris Johnston. But she's touched on so many people's awakening journey um, in, in this work. And this is one of a, um, a, a quote that she uses in one of the videos on the Pachamama Alliance program, which I've sort of taken and, and used frequently because it's so helpful. Um, she says, if, if we said, don't worry, everything's going to be okay, would it really elicit from us our greatest creativity and courage? No. It's a knife edge of uncertainty where we come alive to our truest power. And that's such a beautiful thing to share, that actually being on the knife edge of uncertainty, and it does set us free, it enables us to be creative and courageous. And there's another um, perspective that's shared from Paul Hawkins, who's the sort of figurehead of Project Drawdown. Um, and his, his the Project Drawdown, if any of you haven't come across it, is a, a 200 or it's a, it's a global research project that was started in 2013 that, that published in 2017 a list of the 100, top 100 solutions to, to drawing down carbon from the atmosphere. So rather than just, uh, uh, you know, curtail, lessen, reduce, how do we actually reframe it entirely? And that our goal should be drawing down carbon so we no longer producing, uh, we're actually drawing down more than we emit. Um, and it's a wonder, he's a wonderful, uh, positive guy in, in that side, that side of his, his character. And he says, what if climate change was actually a gift to us? So what if it was a gift and enabled us to step up and grow up? So two perspectives there. I'm just going to share a couple of other useful perspectives that are um, that have been around for a few years and are, are really sort of coming into uh, more mainstream thinking. So one of the problems with our economic model is, is it's a closed loop design and it doesn't allow in any of the complexity of the earth. It sort of externalizes everything. All the costs of business, the costs of our life, the costs of our economy are externalized for people, communities and the earth to pick up. And we're using you know, more than 1.7 Earths a year, which as we know is only going to end in one place. But Kate Rayworth's model, um, she talks about the, the big things that shift people are being able to put things simply. And so her idea was to actually create a donut model for economics. Um, and she said, where we need to be uh, as, a, as a society, as a species, how we live on this earth is that we need to be within the ecological ceiling of the planet. Um, but also we need to, uh, within the social foundations. So we need to be putting enough into the social foundations to enable people to get their needs met. And we also need to be doing that within the ecological limits of the planet. It's really, really basic and simple. And you would think that our economic model was doing that anyway, that chasing GDP is not going to get us here. And at the moment, there is a massive shortfall in the middle, and it depends where you live in the world as to how big your shortfall is. But there's also significant overshoot. So I think in all of these uh, ecological elements, apart from the ozone layer, we're into massive overshoot. Um, but this is a really useful framework to think about where we need to land 
So it gives us a really useful and practical goal. And I think the Netherlands has just adopted this as an economic model to work with for their post-COVID um, emergence. Um, I don't know much more than that, but it'd be great to see how, they, how that emerges and who else takes it on. This is another really useful map um, that I found in terms of understanding the shift. Um, this is a, a, a piece of uh, a chart that, that was articulated by a guy called Bill Reed, who works for an organization or works within an organization called Regenesis, which is in, in northern, the northern US. And this isn't a two by two, uh, but if it was, the good thing is we all need to be in the top right hand box uh, and we like that. Um, but what it shows is that we are currently on this degenerative pathway, we're in a degenerating system and we're using much more energy than we've got to sustain that system. And this is where business as usual is. And green is one step better than business as usual. Business as usual is one step better than breaking the law. Um, but green is nowhere near where we need to be. Green is Amazon saying we're going to have an electric fleet of uh, you know, uh, vans to deliver things by 2030. That's just completely not where we need to be. And that isn't going to change a thing. But green is, is all doing our recycling. Green is... Uh, wrapping the things that we consume in um, cell cellulose-based packaging rather than plastic-based packaging. We're still consuming. Um, sustainable is 100% less bad. Sustainable is used differently by different people. So in this chart, it's used in this, this way to be 100% less bad. And while that's so far from where we are today, it's still not where we need to be understanding ourselves to be. So then we've got restorative, which is what George Monbiot talks about, and, and seeing ourselves as part of nature. But actually where we need to be is actually in this regenerative space, co-evolving. Co it's being part of a co-evolution of the whole system. We need to get out of the way of trying to control nature. So even trying to restore it is trying to tell it what it needs to do and where it needs to do it. And we actually got, a, I was just thinking as I was putting this presentation together, we got a really tiny glimpse of what regenerative might enable when we all shut our doors and went inside at the beginning of lockdown. There are some of the rivers in India that have completely transformed during that, the, the weeks that, that India was, has been in lockdown. And everything that humans were trying to do to, to reduce the pollution in the river went nowhere compared to what nature can do for itself. Um, so there is, there, is, there is a slight indication of what might happen if we really step back. But we really need to see ourselves as nature. We are nature, nature is us. And to separate is just to create the problems that we, we're, where we're at. So thinking about how we reframe how we operate, how we reframe our understanding of who we are in relation to the earth, and the significant amount of energy and just rewiring that's required to get there. It is a really joyous journey when you get on the journey. I was thinking, well, how do, what, do, what can coaches do? And I puzzled with this, this idea for, for a while. Um, and it was in January of last year. And I think a lot of people, I think the earth was speaking very loudly last year. A lot of people woke up and if we're going to recreate or, or if coaching is going to be a really real a really different value and really adopt that wide angled lens that Peter Hawkins often talks about then we need to redefine coaching with our social system and our ecological system really in the frame so why not regenerative coaching and why not define it in this way Regenerative coaching is for enhancing the health of our biosphere and life-giving properties of our planet. It's underpinned by everything we know, by models of coaching grounded in established and new techniques associated with adult and child learning, psychology, leadership, living systems thinking, emergent approaches, so theory you would be in there, ecology, ecosystems, economy and regenerative design. So we need to open both the window into which we're looking, but we also need to educate ourselves much more widely than thinking about how do we shift this individual's psychology. So uh, Hetty Einzig added a little bit into this uh, in, in about March this year. 
So what might it be if we really repurposed our coaching to be regenerative and to hold those bigger frames in mind? Hmm. And so then if that's the lens that we're going to be, or the, the space that we're going to be operating in, and I guess just sort of going back um, to that, a regenerative framework and a regenerative idea for coaching and really sort of leaning into this space, there is so much possibility. There is so much to be done. There is so much space. So what might this mean? From a whole systems perspective, we often have these blobs of there's the organization, the team, the individual, societies out there somewhere, and the ecology is out there, and often that's not even on the diagram. So if we were going to bring those all together into our coaching work, we might have something that looked a little bit more like this. I mean, we're quite good at lining individual and team up. We're quite good at lining team and organization, or at least we know how. But what we now need to do is to really bring the social ecology into the frame and the natural ecology into the frame. So we need to see ourselves very differently, ourselves, our coaches, um, our whole practice, the businesses we work with really differently. And we need to stand in this place if we're going to reframe our practice, which is we're part of all of these systems. And again, the lovely Dr. Josie McLean down in Adelaide uses these diagrams that are called whole on diagrams. Um, and if you notice, there's no actual hard lines between any of the systems. Is it just as in our body? If we think about um, a cell, a cell is, is a, a systems within systems even there. It's a cell within a system of a tissue, a tissue within a system of an organ, an organ within a tissue of say the blood system or the nervous system or um, the, the lymph system. But we're systems within systems, even the way that we're constructed. And every part of that system negotiates, negotiates it, its needs, gets its needs met in relation to the wider context it's in. And that's how it needs to be in our work. So we need to ne we negotiate how our, our needs are met within the system of the family, the team that we're in. And that works within the system of the organization, the community. But organizations often don't pay any attention to the social ecology or to the natural ecology. They might have a, um, a, a sort of policy on, um, let's do some charity work over here, or let's do a little bit over here but actually really deeply negotiating their place in the system that they live within is, is not really considered sufficiently, otherwise we wouldn't be here where we are. So how do we as coaches really sit with and support people to negotiate and their organisations to negotiate their place in all of these systems? Because this is truly where we sit. I now use this as a contracting diagram. And I don't necessarily, well, I don't always at all insist that my coachees fill in every level of the system, but every level of the system is always there. So in addition to the questions that Peter might invite you to ask yourself, so how, does, how is our coaching work going to serve the stakeholders in the social and natural ecology? Having this diagram on my contracting sheet enables people to see that there are, there are layers that go beyond themselves, the team, the organization and actually people start to then as they move through their coaching program become much more aware we can bring the social ecology in because the diagrams there in the contracting session the diagrams there about the natural ecology so we can bring it in as seems relevant as we go through but we don't have to push it in but that was just a little aside so what is the work that we need to do as individual coaches and how does that help us um, so earlier to the, towards the back end of last year and early this year, I spoke to just a handful of people, about 10 people who are working more from a, um, with the earth in mind in their practice or moving towards that. And these are some of the things that, that um, the shifts that they made. So in terms of their own raising awareness, shifting consciousness, was spending time to hear the call and creating time for that. 
being in contact with the earth either in terms of the activities you engage in it might be gardening it might be walking but being in the earth it might be your practices outside but paying attention to your being and developing your your consciousness and actually bringing together your heart work of your care care for the world and your business people felt incredibly empowered so it was a really um, generative place to sit and um, really creating contact connection and understanding the context you're working within and also working through that fear and anger raising awareness and so that we can take greater ownership and responsibility goes right back to John Whitmore's definition of coaching so there's nothing here that we're asking you to do or people to do in service of the wider ecology that isn't in, in the coaching space. Practices that people have found really resource them when they're doing this work is connection to their community, respecting the ancestors that, that have come before and attending to what's emerging. So that is not judging what's gone on in the past, but knowing that everything that's gone before is creating the platform for you to, to do the work you need to do now. So it's using the resourcefulness of what's happened before, even your own learning to empower you. Slowing further down and listening. If you remember, we've got 3.8 years of, of uh, research and development on life to listen to. So we can't ever slow down enough. So if you're feeling you're going too slow, that's just uh, unhelpful thinking. To have courage and to, to use a community to give you courage and to be so compassionate, exquisitely compassionate towards yourself and others as you're on this journey and to work with curiosity and to consider what's a fair exchange. We all sit in a very privileged position being uh, sitting in the West, sitting in this place that we're at. Not all of us are sitting in the West. I do acknowledge that. But if we're on this call, we're likely to have had a lot of privilege compared to others. Um, and it might not have been an easy journey, but we have privilege. And what's the fair exchange for what we do? So rather than thinking what's the market rate, what's the right rate? What's the right exchange for this work? And sometimes it's not money. Many times it's not money. Many times it's other things. So these are the practices that, that people have found resourcing. And I'm sure there are many others. But if we're working from this place of raised awareness, with a constant set of practices that support us, um, then actually our connection to the wider system needs to, can be less critical, can be less um, demanding. And we can invite our clients into this journey uh, rather than beat them up. As uh, I think Linda Raspi said once, I don't have to go and beat people up with the IPCC report. I can just remark to them how important the environment is to me. And I can just notice it and bring in um, and, and raise awareness of the ecology that's already in the room. We can build our client's capacity to see connection. We can build our, um, those opportunities for recognition of, of the ecology. We can create pathways for imagining different ways of being. We can use new maps and we can continue to work with this different sense of time, this elongated sense of time. So if we do the work on ourselves and we have those practices of compassion, then actually we can invite our clients into a very different kind of conversation. So I am in a short while going to invite you into a, a final breakout room. I'm just going to share a couple of um, frameworks that may be useful, a couple of ideas that, that are not mine. All of this is borrowed from what's already out there. So these are the, the shifts that people like Joanna Macy and Otto Sharma talk about in their work. So a deeper sense of time. Often in our coaching conversations, we think about in six months time, in a year's time, we might even think to the end of the person's lifetime. But what about inviting someone who's not even on this earth yet, someone who's living in 200 years time? How are, you know, writing a letter to them? How are you creating their future? Or from Peter Hawkins' perspective, a future back, what are they saying, you, saying thank you to you for? Developing that greater sense of community, really moving from I to we, to notice when people are splitting and creating polarities, how do we bring those things together and create connection? That really deep interconnectedness. 
And if we just think about ourselves again for a minute, I was reading a book on, um, on health the other day, and actually most of the DNA in our body does not belong to us. It belongs to the several pounds of bacteria that sit in our gut biome. There's about 10 times more, more DNA in our gut bacteria than is in our cells. And so we are an integration of so much. So we are an expression of life that actually is integrated through everything that's gone before. So how do we develop that interconnectedness? Who are all the people, animals, resources involved in achieving X? You can play with this, really play with this. Moving from an idea of systems from closed to open. Who and what are you not including here that serves you and your organization? Who are the suppliers, the suppliers' families? What's, who are the, you know, the trees and the forests that supply you with your paper? You can take it as far as you, as far as you can, actually. From control to emergent. So these sort of shifts are the four shifts that are described um, to really help us move from an old paradigm thinking to a new paradigm thinking and get a sense of who we are in relation to the wider systems that we're part of. There's also this lovely work of Kathleen Allen and I'm just looking for her book, it's not on the shelf next to me today, um, but Living Systems Leadership, Leading from the Roots. So she says, instead of thinking about what do I need to control, ask the question of your clients, what can you unleash? Instead of thinking who can make this work, think of what partnerships will make this work, what connections will help enable this to flourish. And in the um, Climate Coaching Alliance that, that Eve, Josie and I um, founded, but many others are taking forward, including many on this call, um, we're constantly trying to let go of things and put groups together to help things flourish and people working with where the energy is rather than trying to centrally control it. So when your uh, client's asking, you know, or sharing what they need to change, instead asking how do we transform the energy that's already in the system? Because the energy will already be there. It just won't be being enabled and facilitated as it could be. Instead of how do I avoid resistance, how do I welcome resistance? In nature, collective intelligence and diversity is at the, you know, at the, is absolutely, between all of us, we all think in very different ways and have had very different experiences and very different understanding. In nature, that diversity and collective intelligence is welcomed. And the only way things emerge uh, in, in a way that, that, is, um, that they flow is that there are many, 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 many fingerprints across the design and across the shape of what emerges. So welcome resistance because there's so much to learn from that. Be curious about it, lean into it. How do I influence individual action becomes how do I influence the field? So really sort of moving into much more of a, a living systems idea of how nature works and bringing that into our, our questions of ourselves, our clients and, and the organizations and systems we live with. And there's also, I, I've managed to put Daniel Christian Wall's huge book into a tiny, tiny little corner on this, on this, um, on this PowerPoint. But there's beautiful questions of what if, what if we were really able to make a difference here. What if the coaching community, the coaching psychologists, the supervisors, the mentors were really able to make a difference here? What is the difference we would see in the, the human earth relationship? That's probably a little bit too egotistical because we're probably a little bit too small, but are we really? What if we were big enough to make a really big difference? So bringing it back to you. There's lots of places things might shift, but actually this is just in our practice. There's so many other places to shift if we really put ourselves at the heart of, um, of the systems we're in. So, I'm going to invite you into breakout rooms of uh, at least three. So we're going to shuffle you around so you might not see the beautiful face that you were with before. But in this, just enjoy 
exploring at the end of this rather wide and deep and fast and all encompassing conversation that I've been having with myself, really have a conversation with each other. How are you? What's really resonating or resonated with you? What's in front of mind as we come to a close? And what's your intention with that? And I'm just going to add in the invitation that Natalia added at the very beginning, is that this is the beginning of a journey or the ongoing, a point in time of an ongoing journey. And the intention is to come back together again uh, sometime later in the year. And maybe just thinking, you know, where would you be in September, October? If the things that have really resonated with you, you've really allowed to land and to emerge. So I'm going to send you off for a good 10, 12 minutes to have that conversation. 10 minutes, actually, because that will take us to um, 2.28. Okay, Sarah. <sighs> Lovely. Okay, so welcome back. And we are due to finish it for a 2.30 and we can um, extend by a couple of minutes if people want to hang around um, for, a, for another five minutes. But it'd be really great just to hear from you all, just share, well, obviously not all at once, but just to share some of the things that, that you're taking away that are with you as you're leaving or with you as you've got to this point. Alison. I wonder if there's a model of coaching that we can use to to introduce the ecosystem within that coaching conversation. Is there? I appreciate what you showed um, with the individual and then the the um, concentric uh, circles. But yeah, is it? Is there anything else? I'm I'm studying coaching just now, so I'm at the very beginning of this um, career journey, and I would love to learn about how to bring in the ecosystem from the beginning so that it becomes very natural and I just wondered if there was anything you could point me towards. <laughs> Sorry I'm laughing Karen because we're all sitting there going yeah we all want to know that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> If so I, there are resources. Well. There are resources. So I'd read Peter Hawkins' work, I'd, mm -hmm. and I, I'd just get into conversation. One of the things that we're doing in the Climate Coaches Alliance, and if Lorenza, I don't think Lorenza's on this call, Lorenza Clifford, but in the UK uh, we have a south a south group of client of coaches who are concerned about this. Is is just joining with the the coaching alliance or joining with other people around you and just work it out because we're all holding that question but there are some clues um and yeah and and find a supervisor who can help you with that as well okay <laughs> thank you just to say i um my dissertation I'm, I'm hoping to develop a model that makes it easy to introduce it so if anyone has got any ideas that they want to suggest to me then please put them on the message or whatever. Thank you very much. Yeah, well, when you do, share it with Jamie because he's creating a seed bank of ideas. So, uh, <laughs> Thank yeah. you. Thanks a lot. Lovely. What else? Yeah, I want to say, I, to I, say I, thank you, Ali. Sorry. I love the perspective you brought. I just wanted to say a huge thank you before I, too many people have to go. Okay. So what, what you've brought and the way you've brought yourself to this has been just lovely and beautiful and totally complementary with the rest of the sessions in the series so a sincere thank you perfect i'm looking forward to the next one where we all get to see what's happened in between so someone else was speaking and and uh, we missed them hi alison it's uh, it's pravin uh Prav there I, I was talking about how to introduce i i had a long thought about it uh after the previous sessions of how to introduce uh, the environment into coaching sessions. I sort of uh, coach uh, entrepreneurs and and small execs, not not big stuff. 
uh, and I normally get them to do a, a pestle analysis, an environment pestle analysis, and and that helps a great deal to hook in uh, environment at that stage, and it works beautifully. Uh, I don't emphasize it; they work it out themselves, and I just, sometimes just drill down further into it. Yeah. Did you say a pestle analysis? P e s t l e. Yes, that's the one. Yeah. Yeah. Perfect. Great. Can I suggest the steeple analysis, which includes ethics, E for ethics. So that builds on what Prav was saying. Um, and it just adds in another dimension as well. Brilliant. If you've got any resources for these, then please just pop any links or resources to them into the um, chat box as well. And then we can share that round later. That'd be great. Okay. As you're leaving, what are you taking? And then we'll, we'll look to close in the next couple of minutes. We did discuss uh, having coaching sessions outside in the, uh, in the open, because I have coached outside whilst walking, uh, and I prefer to do that as, my, as one of my options rather than sitting. So I'll do the first one face to face in an office and, and then carry out coaching outdoors uh, if, if it's preferable. Great, great. Okay, so I think if, if we're all done, we may close and just say thank you hugely for being here. And uh, I look forward to seeing what emerges and I look forward to coming together again later in the year when uh, we're all together to take the next step and see where we are as a, as a group. <laughs>